All right, so where we left off with in our video that was online, right, and retreading a little bit of ground here, um, is looking at a vanadium example, right? And so we've looked at these different values for delta octahedral. Um, and for a D1 metal, we saw a single absorbance in the UV vis spectrum. And we can directly relate that to a transition for delta octahedral because there's only one electron. So the, trans, the transition that we can measure happens to be delta octahedral. So if we move up to D2, right, we drew out a few different possibilities, a ground state and an excited state. And if these levels were degenerate, you might still expect a single transition. But that's actually not what we see, right? So if we look at the vanadium three plus cation, so this is the aqua complex, so it's surrounded by water molecules we see that there's actually two different absorbances. And so with our initial understanding of that T2G and EG set, we don't have a set of tools that help us understand where these two absorbances are coming from. And the reason that our picture is overly simplified has to do with the derivation of our orbitals. So again, our orbitals are derived using a hydrogen atom and a single electron. So as soon as we have more than one electron, our orbitals start to not be degenerate, right? Our, that, um, the derivations for those energy levels don't take into account the fact that there are electron-electron interactions. So specifically within that same set of D orbitals, there's something called angular coupling, which is the different orbitals actually interacting with each other a little bit, right? And we could imagine some amount of electron-electron repulsion occurring between these orbitals. And so because of that, we don't have a simplified um, orbital picture anymore. We actually don't have that nice degenerate set the way that it appears. They do have slightly different energies. And so what we have to do is when we look at our octahedral field, we can find all these different um, types of absorbances and electronic transitions. And this is what is plotted on its nabe sugano diagram. Now there's a lot of information here to process. What we see along our left-hand axis, down here in the bottom left, we see that free ion term symbol that we derived, right? So this would be a triplet F for our D2 metal. And so this left-hand barrier is what we called our, call our weak field limit, right? This is where essentially delta octahedral is approaching zero. So we call this a weak field limit because you would see this as your ligand field gets weaker and weaker. Um, or you're using weak field, uh, uh, sorry, if you're using weak field ligands, right, those are things that are pi donors. So we talked about our spectrochemical series going from strong field ligands, which were pi acceptors, up to our weak field ligands, which were like pi donors. So over on our left axis here, we actually see symbols that um, correlate to our free ion. So these are the electronic states of just the, in this case, just the vanadium three plus. Right, if it didn't have any ligands surrounding it, these would be our possible electronic states. We also notice that they are color coded. So we have both red and blue color coding on this diagram. Um, the blue represents our ground state, right? So we can see again that that triplet F is our ground state. And any other blue symbols that we have correlate to spin allowed excited states. So again, we go back to our spin selection rules saying that our multiplicity cannot change in the course of an electrical or electronic excitation. And so that means if we are starting at a triplet spin state, the only allowed transition that we have is to another triplet spin state. So it just deals with the superscript three, right? So these, anytime we see a blue line, that is a spin allowed transition. The red lines are spin forbidden transitions. So in this case, our singlet D, a singlet G, and our singlet S way, way, way up here at the north end of our spectrum, these are spin forbidden because we see a change in our multiplicity, right? If we go from a triplet to a singlet, that is a spin forbidden transition. Essentially, this happens if you're drawing the electron as flipping sign or flipping direction uh, when it goes from the ground state to the excited state. So now if we move away from our left axis, this is now saying we're introducing our molecule into an octahedral field, right? We're introducing our molecule into an octahedral field. And so we start to see these different electronic states uh, vary, 
um, as they go into our octahedral field. And these labels themselves refer to the degeneracy of the, um, the electron configuration. So essentially, if you see a T, that means it's a triplet, uh, or it's, it's triply degenerate, sorry, meaning that there's three different ways you can draw the electron configuration that all look the same or similar. Um, and you don't need to worry about where these labels come from. I'm not asking you to derive them today. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to derive them. All we need to do is be able to identify them. So these labels correspond to the lines on the graph. So this blue line right here, right, is our triplet T2G label. And so we can see here that I have a ground state, which is my triplet 1G state. Again, we don't have to understand where these labels come from, but that's what we're gonna call this blue line on the bottom. And we can have an accessible excited state that matches this label of triplet T2G. And so we can see here that the blue lines correspond to those spin allowed transitions. So again, where our um, superscript label doesn't change, right? So triplet to triplet. So you could actually plot these graphs with only the blue lines for most of what we're gonna do and be okay. Um, it might make them a little bit less dense, but still it's, it's um, it's important sometimes to have the red lines because as something I talked about in our video, when we say forbidden, forbidden is a rather strong word, right? These transitions aren't actually forbidden. It's more like unlikely. So they can still occur, right? And part of that comes from our molecule. If it twists or bends, it starts to break the symmetry. And we can all of a sudden have um, some of these Laporte forbidden kinds of transitions. So here we have this graph and we could guess, right, based on this plot, that those two peaks that we saw in our vanadium spectrum correspond to our ground state, our triplet T1G state, going first, the lower energy peak being our triplet T2G set, right? So this blue arrow representing our first electronic transition. And our second electronic transition or absorbance is where our ground state, our triplet T1G, is being excited to our triplet T1G excited state, right? So we might be able to guess that these first two transitions are the blue arrow and this orange arrow respectively. So we can go ahead and assign these on our graph, right? So we have our vanadium spectrum here and using our tanabe sugano diagram, we can at the very least make a guess about which electronic transition we are observing here. And it's just based on the order that they appear on the tsunabe sugano diagram. So we're always going from our ground state to an excited state. We are never gonna be looking at things that are from an excited state to another excited state, right? We are not going to do that. So we're always looking from that bottom blue line up to one of these other electronic transitions. So I can make some guesses here about what these labels might look like. And so now we have to figure out what do we do with these labels? So in order to answer these kinds of questions, you will need that Tanabe Sugano collection PDF that's posted on Canvas as well. Um, I'm gonna show the actual diagrams here, but that's gonna be something you will probably want to have printed out so you can um, easily look at it and kind of draw on it if you need to um, going forward. So we look at this absorbance um, spectrum and what we notice is there's two peaks. So we will need these two absorbances, right? So what we have to do is first things first, we have to actually break down and process our absorbance spectrum. So I see that I have two peaks here. So the um, first peak is at about 562 nanometers and the second peak is at 389 nanometers. And so these are the wavelengths of light that are being absorbed in the visible region for this vanadium three plus um, cation. <clears throat> now, our first step is actually going to be converting our wavelength values into something that we can use that's a little bit easier um, to relate energy. So if we go back again to Chem 124, right, way, way back in the day, our Gen Chem sequence, um, we learned that the equation, right, or the relationship between wavelength and energy is inversely proportional. So one of the very common mistakes that happens here, um, and I'll tell you that I, I will probably see this uh, mistake happen in the next, you know, two, a couple weeks as we're working on these problems, 
is to look at these nanometer um, values as if they are energy, right? They are not energy. They are related to an energy of light. And so you might be tempted to look at this and say like, okay, well, you know, the difference between these two is about 200 nanometers. And that's true. But if you just said that the difference in energy was 200 nanometers, you would be incorrect, right? These energy values are more complicated because they're inversely proportional to the wavelength. So what we have to do as our very first step is we have to convert these wavelengths into a unit of energy. So this could really be any unit of energy that you're comfortable with using. Um, but the easiest one to convert is actually just going to wave numbers. So this is going from nanometers to inverse centimeters. And so the equation is written on that PDF. So you have it in front of you. Um, but you just do one over the wavelength times 10 to the negative seventh power. And so we can break these down for our two different transitions and see that our 562 nanometer absorbance corresponds to an energy, right? The wave number of 1,700, 794 inverse centimeters. We can do the same process for our 389 signal and we end up with a wave number value of 25707. And so here, right, we can see that we've gotten rid of that inverse dependence on our, um, our wavelength to energy. And so now we can actually directly compare the energy of these two different signals, right? We can directly compare our first signal to our second signal. All right, so. Here we are, right? We can compare our two energy values, right, for these absorbances. And it makes sense if we're going to try to calculate an energy value for delta octahedral that we will need to use some version of an actual energy, right? And a unit that conveys energy um, and not one that just confers the wavelength of our light. So let's move on from here, right? So this was step one is convert our wavelengths in our spectrum to an actual energy value using wave numbers. So we're gonna do step two and step three next. So again, if we're looking at this Tanabe-Sugano diagram, um, what we see here is that we actually don't know our value for delta octahedral, right? That's actually what we're trying to solve for. We don't know our value for B, this recall parameter, and so what we need to do is we need to figure out where our starting point is. And so the way we do this is we get our ratio of our um, second uh, energy absorbance to our first energy absorbance, right? So nu2 divided by nu1. And what we see is that the second absorbance is about 1.44. Um, the, the ratio here is 1.44 to 1. Now, the old school way of doing this is you would take a ruler, an actual physical ruler, and you would take your printed Snabe Sugano diagram and you would kind of slide it along your X axis until you find the point where the distance to our first transition is one, uh, or sorry, the distance to our second transition is 1.44 when you divide it by the distance of our first transition. Right, that's the old school way of doing this um, is actually with a ruler and you're kind of constantly doing these quick little calculations to get into the right ballpark for these transitions. Thankfully, right, by calling this old school a couple times that implies that there's a new school method to do this. Um, and so there's actually a set of plots that's posted um, at the end of that Snabe Sugano collection PDF that provides the, these ratio values more directly. And so if we go and we find the one for D2, we can see that this plot um, is actually a much quicker way for us to determine this value of delta octahedral over B, right? So step two was we get our ratio of our second um, absorbance to our first absorbance. And step three is then we go to this plot here, right? This number is 1.44. So I would try to find 1.44 on this plot. I go over and see where it intersects with the red line. And then I would go down and see that my value for delta octahedral over B is about 31, right? And so the idea here is we wanna make as careful of a guess as we can um, when we're deriving this value for delta octahedral over B. So this was steps two and three. We get this ratio and then we go and we determine this value for delta O over B. Then we see that in this case, it was 31.
right? So depending on this ratio, we could end up in a number of different spots along this curve. If that ratio had ended up being two, right, our value would be about 15. So this is how we can go ahead and use this second plot here. Um, so this plot here, so there's a question about um, which plots do we use. This is used for any D2 um, case. So anytime we have a D2 metal, um, this is the plot that we would use because this is derived using the values off of the Tanabe Sugano diagram. So now we have our value for delta octahedral over B. So what can we do with this? So now we're gonna go back to our, our Tanabe Sugano diagram. We're gonna find out where we are along our X axis. We find out that we're at 31, right? So now we actually know we have at least a starting point to look at our Tsunabe Sugano diagram again. So this value here describes our complex on the Tsunabe Sugano diagram along the x-axis, right? Where we are on the x-axis. So we can go ahead and draw a nice big line here, right? So like I said, it's really helpful when you're doing these problems on the Tsunabe Sugano diagrams to have it printed out and next to you. Um, because it makes it easier to actually draw on the spectrum, right? So based on this derived value using those two absorbances, we know that we are at this delta octahedral over B value of 31. So I can draw this nice black line on the spectrum and say, this is the absorbances that I would expect to see for my given complex. So depending on where we're looking, we very well could have seen maybe a very weak absorbance, right? That is from our blue line to this bottom red one. That'd be a spin forbidden transition. Um, and so, you know, if we go back to the, the metrics that we were using from the video, that means that we would have an extremely small value for epsilon, right? For any of these transitions that go to red lines, but we might actually end up seeing them. So it is important to know that they're here. So let's look at where we are, right? We're going back to kind of um, the, the way that I, I tend to describe these things of thinking of where's our ultimate goal, right? What is the thing we're trying to solve for? Ultimately, we want to understand our value for delta octahedral. And currently we don't have a value for delta octahedral. We have delta octahedral divided by this Rakhal parameter. So what that means is we need to actually be able to figure out what this Rakhal parameter is in order to solve for this value of delta O. So thankfully, right, we can do this using, again, our plot. So we know where this absorbance should be. So if we trace this line up, our first electronic excitation, that triplet 2G state occurs right here. So if I trace this over along and see my Y axis, right, this value that I could try to derive is about 29 along my Y axis. And so this is the energy of that transition divided by B. And so we can, we know what this energy of this first transition is, right? We already calculated this when we looked at those wave numbers for our transitions. And we also have a second value for our second transition. So the first step, once we have, the, or after we got our delta octahedral over B, now we can figure out exactly what is the ratio of the energy of that transition to this Rakhal parameter, right? This E over B um, step. And so we can get these two values here and this allows us to actually solve for B. So we can solve for it using our first electronic transition, right? This first energy divided by B was equal to 29. So if I plug in the energy for that first transition, again, we have to use our energy values. We can't use values, or we can't use the wavelength that was in nanometers. We have to use an actual energy value divided by B. That's equal to 29, right? So all I did was just plug in my value for energy here. And then I can solve for a value for this recall parameter B. I can repeat this process again, right? For that second energy value. Right, so that second energy value for that second absorbance, the energy divided by that recall parameter is equal to 41. So I can plug in a value for that second energy, right? That 25,707 divided by B is equal to 41. And I can find another value for my recall parameter as being 627 inverse centimeters.
So with these two values, right, I would average them out. So the reason they're different maybe is in where I picked my lambda max on my absorbance spectrum. Maybe I didn't do a great job in estimating my um, E over or my um, E over B signals, right? When I was looking at the Y axis on my plot. So I would go ahead and average these out. And I would say that my average value for this Rakab parameter is 620 inverse centimeters or wave numbers. So I'm in the closing stretch, right? We we're going through the same process no matter how many times we're digging into its Nabe Sugano diagram. Um, we're going to look and, and try to derive um, our delta octahedral, right? And that's our ultimate goal is get to a value for delta octahedral. So with this, with this value for our um, recall parameter in hand, we can go ahead and look at deriving our delta O. Right, so we know that the delta octahedral over B is equal to 31. This is something we got a few slides back uh, when we looked at the ratio of our second to our first signal. Well, now we actually know a value for that recall parameter, right? It's 620 inverse centimeters. So that means that we can use this to derive a value um, for delta octahedral. And again, we wanna keep our units um, in, in consideration here. Right, so the delta octahedral that we would predict is 19,229 um, wave numbers. Now, this is again just an energy value, so we can convert this to other units we're more comfortable with or more familiar with. Right, so we can convert this to something like electron volts, which we've seen when we looked at binding energies in the past. Right, um, and so this correlates again just to this energy difference. Right, now we can actually quantify the energy difference between this T2G and this EG set on our molecular orbital diagrams. One thing that's interesting, right, or of note here, is that we can actually convert this back to a wavelength value, right, for delta octahedral. So normally I would leave this in electron volts or wave numbers because those are actual energy values. But just as a, a thought experiment here, right, we can convert this back to a wavelength and we see that this wavelength is 520 nanometers. And the point I'm, I wanna drive home with this is that this value, this 520 nanometers is not observed on our spectrum, right? So if we pull up our spectrum here, right, this was that initial spectrum that we had, 520 nanometers, which falls somewhere down in this ballpark, right, is not a peak on our spectrum. So I just want to reinforce that we cannot just look at a spectrum and derive delta octahedral. We actually do have to use these Tanabe Sugano diagrams in order to get that value for that delta octahedral, right? So 520 is not on the spectrum because it directly is not an absorbance, right? We have absorbances that are these other electronic excited states. All right. So if you have been looking through the packet of the Tanabe Sugano diagrams, you'll see that these get even more complicated, right? If you go and you look at our D2 case, it's actually relatively simple. When you compare it, for example, to the mess, that is a D4 um, Tanabe Sugano diagram, right? And so D4 to D7 um, metals are have ugly, really gross Tanabe Sugano diagrams. Um, and the reason for that is something we've actually looked at all the way back in week one of our class. And that's because what we're looking at here is an increasing value for our delta octahedral. Um, and as that difference in energy gets larger and larger, um, we actually can have a spin state transition, right? So for small values of delta octahedral, it's more likely to have a high spin state. And for large values of delta octahedral, it's more likely to have a low spin state where our electrons are all paired up. This is really only true for D4 to D7 metals. D8 and D9 metals do not have a different high and low spin state um, that can be their ground state. But this spin transition is represented on the Tanabe Sugano diagram by this big black line that's right in the middle. So we can see that on the left, right, is a different set of black or of red and blue lines than on the right. We're still doing the same exact process we did before. We're still looking at these electronic transitions. We're still only allowed to go from blue to blue. It just so happens that our ground state changes when we pass this black line. So we can see here on the left-hand side, our ground state 
is a, um, a pentet, right, uh, with the, the superscript five, whereas our low spin state on the right is a triplet state. So that just changes what our actual absorbances can be, right? It changes what our absorbances can be. So this process gets a little bit more convoluted, or at least the spectra get more complicated, but the, the steps that you would take are the same no matter what spectrum you're looking at. Right, you convert your wavelengths to energies, right? These wave number values, you get the ratio of your two lowest energy signals. You use that to derive a value for delta O over B. And then you go back to your Tsunabe Sugano diagram to get your Y axis values at that delta O over B. And you use that to derive a value for your recall parameter B. And lastly, you can get to a value for delta octahedral. Like I said, it's very much this kind of dance of steps to walk through it, but it's always the same exact steps, right? They're predictable in that way. Um, so this is something that we're going to get some practice with, right? So there's a few practice problems we can kind of dig into um, as we talk about this.